Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's retirement ceremony in honor of Colonel Carl E. Mason Sr.'s more than 34 years of service to the United States Army. I am Lieutenant Colonel Ted Zagraniski, your Master of Ceremonies. For anyone experiencing their first Army ceremony today, I will be your guide to the proceedings. Shall we begin? The host of today's ceremony is Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen, the Army's Deputy Chief of Staff, G9. Please rise as you are able for honors to the nation and remain standing for the invocation. The national anthem is performed today by Dr. Seralda Herbin, and the invocation will be given by Pastor Gordon Jenkins. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the red we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets rock and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that a flag was still there oh say does that star Father, this is a day that you have made, and we do rejoice. We're glad in it. We are thankful for so many blessings that you have uh, poured out so richly and abundantly upon our lives. We thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. And yet uh, today, especially on a day like today, we are mindful that our freedom is not free. And so we give you thanks for all of those generations of armed service members who have procured and have purchased that freedom at such great cost individually and to their families and with their lives of sacrifice. Thank you for all of those who are present today who are in that number. We count it a, a blessing, Lord. Lord, we especially on this day, we give you thanks of one in particular, one very special to all of those who are here today, and that is your servant, Colonel Carl Mason. Lord, we thank you for your hand of blessing upon Brother Carl's life, your hand of faithfulness and provision and protection uh, that you have poured out upon him uh, through these many years of service to our great nation. Father, uh, we, we just thank you for also the, the thousands, literally <clears throat> thousands of lives that are richer and better and more virtuous because of the sacrifice and service of Carl Mason. And so we give you uh, thanks and praise. And Lord, those things that <clears throat> Colonel Mason held dear that sense of integrity, of doing the right thing the right way when no one else is looking, that he has passed on to, to many, many other soldiers and others that he's had influence upon. We pray that that uh, passing of the baton that we see today will be carried out in faithful lives of sacrifice and service for many years, again, through the thousands that you have touched through the service and sacrifice of Colonel Mason. 
Lord, we are also mindful that he did not do this alone. And so we thank you for his precious wife, Christina, for their children, Sam and Maya and Carl Jr. We're mindful that the sacrifice was not Carl's alone, but theirs as well. And we thank you for how you held them together as a family. And they didn't, Brother Carl didn't just minister alone, they ministered as a family. And they sacrificed and served as a family. And so, again, we thank you for that testimony and that light that you set before many because of them as a family. So bless them for that service. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you as we look on and, and we behold Colonel Mason's life, that as we come to this day of transition, this, this day of blessing, that with the Apostle Paul, uh, Colonel Mason can say, I have fought a good fight. Yes. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Yes. That Lord, you blessed him in such a way that he did not lose his faith in his service, but his faith was strengthened by your grace. And it was manifest in a life of faith and good works. So, Father, we thank you for that, that he can, he can say that with confidence. And all of the, those who have watched his, his career unfold and who are here to give testimony to that today know that he has fought a good fight and he has kept the faith. Yeah. Uh, he, he has finished that course set before him with honor and with distinction. And so, Lord, uh, we bless you and we praise you and we would humbly ask for your presence and your blessing upon our time together. Uh, Lord, may we not just rush through this time. This is a time of celebration for a life of service and sacrifice well lived. And so we, we humbly ask for your, your blessing. And uh, Lord, uh, just bless every aspect of those who will speak and uh, Brother Carl as well. But be with our time and may it bring honor and glory to you. And we pray all of these things in the name of your mighty son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to extend a warm welcome to the many family, friends, and colleagues in attendance today. And a special welcome to Colonel Mason's wife, Mrs. Christina Mason, and their children, Second Lieutenant Samara Mason, United States Air Force, Miss Samaya Mason, and Carl E. Mason, Jr. Welcome. Welcome also to the Honorable Larry Turner, Inspector General of the United States Department of Labor, the Honorable Kathleen Miller, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Comptroller, and Miss Noreen McDonald. And greetings to the many members of the Mason family, colleagues, and friends who are here today or are watching us around the world. Please join me in a round of applause for our distinguished guests. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce the host of today's ceremony, Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen. Okay. All right. I hope I can read this. I didn't bring my glasses. It's all good. How are we doing today? Great. Awesome. And so uh, I do want to recognize our uh, general officers, retired general officers, and active duty general officers as well. So thank you all for for coming today. Um, this, is a, um, this is a historical day as we say farewell to Carl Mason, Colonel Carl Mason, um, and, uh, and I do want to say thank you to the family. I know we recognize uh, Christina and uh, the children, and, and uh, we do have a lot of family members that have traveled from um, here and far to uh, be here for the ceremony today. So. I want to say thank you all for uh, gracing us today and thank you for supporting the Mason family. And so I'll just sum it up. Um, I'll tell you the prayer had my whole speech in it. Uh, <laughs> it really did. So that was a wonderful prayer. You must have been reading my notes. 
with your eyes closed, but uh, it's all good. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't have said it better than what was in the prayer, but I will try to, as my uh, dad used to say, I'm from the country, so you know, I'm going to cut across the, the cornfield here and at least try to bring this to a close at some point in time. So um, I, I do want to say it, it is an honor for me to be able to do this for Carl and, um, and his family. I'm just so honored. and It's great to have so many people in the room here, which really is, uh, it really represents what Carl's all about. And I'll just talk a little bit about that in a minute. But, you know, I, I do want to just talk about Christina and how they met and, um, and how Carl kind of, I guess, roped her in. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they met at uh, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And if you know anything about Pembroke and where it is, I think they call it Pembroke, but I call it Pembroke because um, I'm from North Carolina. So, um, you know, it was an opportunity where I think Carl, when he first saw her, he laid eyes on her and said, he's going to marry her one day. Uh, you're a mighty confident man that your wishes came true there, Carl. Uh, and so I, I can say, uh, I guess, he had to use some of our famous art, um, artists, musical artists, uh, using the eight track and the cassette uh, to kind of get her where she thought she would want to marry him. And, uh, I think he said he listed some artists like, you know, Tina Marie and Teddy Pendergrass and, you know, Cameo and Luther. I don't have to say his last name because y'all know who I'm talking about. Uh, I was a little shocked that you didn't mention Earth, Wind and Fire, which is my favorite group. But it's all good. Whatever works for you, it's what works for you. And so I think uh, after that, Christina said, um, maybe. Maybe, um, but I think it was uh, really the, you know, the greatest fraternity that kind of turned the tables. And uh, you know, when you kind of wearing the colors of crimson and cream, you have no other option but to fall in line. So, <laughs> Christina, thank you for gracing us, and uh, Carl did his work. So uh, that was the game changer, I'm sure. And 24 years later, or so um, here we are. You all are still uh, married, and we really want to say what a wonderful family. So I know, Carl, if your parents were alive today, uh, they would be absolutely proud of you. But I know they're smiling from heaven that, um, you know, a young man from the big city of Goldsboro, <laughs> you know, dreaming one day that he could wear the, you know, the uh, Carolina blue, which I'm a fan as well. Dean Smith and playing for Dean Smith uh, at North Carolina, but I will just tell you, you signed on to the greatest team um, that uh, our country could have, and that's the United States military, specifically the United States Army. And so uh, you have served on a championship team, and, uh, and I want you to know that. So Carl is a masterful soldier and logistician. Uh, if you read his biography, you will absolutely know that his career stands on its own. It needs no validation, it needs no clarification. Uh, he served and commanded at every echelon, and he's also led our soldiers in combat. So I'm not gonna talk about his numerous jobs that he's performed, but I do have just a few uh, notes from folks who I reached out to to kind of put in some words the impact of Carl Mason. And I'm just going to read a few. Um, and this one says, Carl is an outstanding person, a family man, and a soldier. You don't have to look far regarding the Mason legacy. Their children are shining stars and are doing great things for America. Carl was my Kimbo in the second tank, 72nd armor. He said, deuce tank in Korea. He learned quickly and was uh, revered revered, excuse me, by the battalion commander and most armor lieutenants. I rolled Carl pretty hard because I knew he had so much potential. I wanted to make Carl a tank platoon leader at one point. However, the raging Cajun said no. <laughs> Major General Honore at the time, Major General Honore. Uh, and, uh, and so he was not going to have a chemo leading uh, officer leading the tank platoon. but. Regardless, he was definitely held in high regard, and that's from Vaughn uh, Brickhouse, who you serve with. Um, I also have a 
note here, and it just uh, says, I find that this day brings a blend of emotions as I reflect on the sacrifice together across the years. I ought to begin by saying thank you to um, the Mason family, uh, and thank you for your service, Carl, over decades of service. We speak about leadership regularly in our profession of arms as if it were some sort of commodity that is easily available in a local store. This couldn't be far from the truth and your legacy of leadership and the imprint you've made on the joint force of Ripple through our national security institutions for decades. And that's from Lee Levy, Major General, U.S. Air Force, retired. Please extend my thanks to Carl and his leadership and dedication to our Army over years, a number of years. I ask that you highlight on behalf of Carl's consistent selflessness, unselfishness. It is never about himself. Rather, Carl has acted as a true servant leader, always seeking to lift others up. And that's from Major General Gavin Lawrence. And then finally, Carl Mason's legacy is set. He will be remembered not only for his intellect, but as a tremendous sustainer and his unique ability to build cohesive teams and make everyone around him feel better and uh, about everything concerning them. And that's from General Charles Hamilton, Commander AMC. So again, uh, just a few of a number of folks who were impacted by, Charles, by uh, uh, Carl and uh, what he's done. And I know that um, what you've seen and what you've heard and what you've read are uh, really the call as a soldier, but I would also say there's a gentleman side to call. And uh, there's a couple things I just want to highlight. One is his deep, deep love for his family. Um, yes, we've all lost family members along the way as we have journeyed in this Army life. But if you've been around him longer than five minutes, I guarantee you he's going to talk about his wife and he's going to talk about his kids. And that is call. Uh, the second thing is his deep faith. He's a man of faith, and he demonstrates it not only uh, in his words, but also in his actions. He truly walks the walk and talks the talk every single day. He's definitely committed, committed to uh, mentoring anyone and everyone, everyone he meets. And he has no problem with tasking me to shore up my mentoring skills as well. He'll just bring folks in my office and say, sir, I need for you to talk to this person. <laughs> I'm like, uh, right now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's met hundreds of men and women and uh, just looking for an ear for someone to listen. And uh, he's a person that was always willing to help. And then the last thing, he's a giver. He's a giver of his time, talents, and resources. And if you want to make an impact in this world, you got to give all three of those, your time, your talent, and your resources. So he's a wonderful soldier, a wonderful person, a wonderful father, husband. But I, I do say I question a couple things that Carl has listed uh, in his bio. First, um, a little bit of over-exaggeration, I think. <laughs> is, uh, his ability to play basketball. I think that was a little over-exaggeration. I haven't seen him play, but um, I, I would just tell you that uh, regarding me, who needs practice call, not me, all right? Uh, he said they called him money. I hope it wasn't a bunch of pennies in his pocket, but um, <laughs> it's probably about what your game like, but anyway. Um, he does a lot of self-promoting, y'all don't know him. So, uh, so money, I, I, maybe one day you and I can get on the court and, uh, and I can teach you a few things, but you gotta come with more than pennies. It costs a lot to play with the big dogs. Uh, <laughs> second is uh, his golfing abilities. Uh, he, said, he said he plays golf, but then he put a note in there, like I, I dress well on the golf course. <laughs> Boy, he did not want that invite. Yeah, he said, I, I dress. I dress good. Said, okay, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that alone. All right. So uh, Carl is, uh, 
it's been an honor to be able to serve with you. It's been an honor to be on this great Army team, and you know, I, I just can't say enough about your family. I want to thank you for the family for your support. You've missed anniversaries, birthdays, special events, honeymoons, and probably anniversaries behind them, and everything else that happens to your family. And um, those are things that we can never get back. And so I want to thank your family for supporting him through that. And when he had to be away, you understood why. Um, it's all about our service to our country and to our Army. And then, Carl, I want to thank you for your service, too. Um, if there's one thing I can share with you is don't ever look back a question why you made the decision to retire. You know, you've given 100% and then some to our Army, and uh, many people don't do that. So you can rest assured that you have answered every call, you've done everything we've asked you to do, and now it's time for you to uh, enjoy the fruits of your labor. And then the, there is a famous quote that I'll, I'll kind of end with, and um, we all know him, the great uh, General Colin Powell. And he says this, and I think if you read and you've heard all the things that Carl has done in his Army career, wearing a uniform, serving soldiers, helping and assisting wherever he can. You know, General Colin Powell is famous for his quote, and he talks about leadership. And he says, leadership is solving problems. And he says, the day that your soldiers stop bringing your problem, their problems to you is the day that you have stopped leading them. And uh, they have lost confidence that you don't either want to help them or you don't care. And either way, it's a failure of leadership. So I'll leave you with that, Carl. You have not failed the Army. You have led, and you have led through some challenging times in our Army. But you've always put your family and your soldiers first. And that's all we can ask for a leader, is to put their family and their soldiers first. And so, Carl, thank you from all of us who are wearing a uniform and those who have worn a uniform. We want to say thank you. and. We wish you Godspeed as you move on to the second phase of your life and your career. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Colonel Mason is now joining Lieutenant General Vereen at center stage for the Retirement Award presentation. At Army functions, the words attention to orders are given prior to the formal presentation of an award or recognition. When you hear those words, everyone is asked to please remain seated, silence all conversations, and focus on the presentation of the award. Attention to orders. To all who shall see these presents greeting, this is to certify that the President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, has awarded the Legion of Merit to Colonel Carl E. Mason, United States Army, for exceptionally meritorious service in duties of great responsibility over a 34-year career, culminating as the Director, Strategic Initiatives Group, Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff G9, from 15 July 2022 to 1 March 2024. Colonel Mason commanded units from company to brigade level, providing steadfast leadership across a broad array of programs geared toward improving readiness and resilience of the total Army. Colonel Mason's achievements, dedication, and exemplary performance are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit on him the Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff G9 at the United States Army. Signed, Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen, Deputy Chief of Staff G9. <laughs> now we ask Mrs. Mason and the children to come up for the certificate presentations.
First, a certificate of retirement from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. To all who shall see these presents greeting, this is to certify that Colonel Carl E. Mason, having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Army on the 29th day of February, 2024. Signed, Randy A. George, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. Next, a certificate of appreciation from the President of the United States. Yeah, it's a special one. Yeah, he didn't, right. he didn't tell me how heavy it was. A certificate of appreciation for service in the armed forces of the United States of America. Colonel Carl E. Mason, I extend my personal gratitude and the sincere appreciation of a grateful nation to you for your patriotic service to our country. Your bravery, dedication in our and dedication in our armed forces helped protect your fellow Americans during a critical moment in our history and contributed to a world of greater security and growing prosperity. Your devotion to duty, honor, and country, in keeping with the long traditions of the finest military in the world, embody the American ideal of selfless service. Our nation owes you an incredible debt. Your commitment and the example you set will inspire future generations to serve with pride and to keep our country secure. You represent the best of our nation, and I join our fellow Americans in saluting you your honorable service. I wish you happiness and success in your next chapter. Signed, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., Commander-in-Chief. And now we have one more certificate to present. This one is for Mrs. Mason. A certificate of appreciation to all who shall see these presents greeting. This is to certify that Mrs. Christina P. Mason, on the occasion of the retirement of your spouse from the United States Army, has earned grateful appreciation for your own unselfish, faithful, and devoted service. Your unfailing support and understanding helped to make possible your spouse's lasting contribution to the nation. Signed, Randy A. George, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. Thank you very much, everyone. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, Sergeant Major Retired James A. Magruder will perform a special tribute known as Old Glory, followed by the presentation of the American flag to Colonel Mason. I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is Old Glory. I fly atop of the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over great institutions of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, 
Truth and justice, I stand for freedom. I am confident, I am arrogant, and I'm proud. When I'm flown with my fellow banners, my head is a little higher. My colors are a little truer. I bow to no other. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped, I am saluted. I am respected, and I'm revered. I'm loved, and I'm feared. I fought in every battle of every war for more than 200 years. Battles such as Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, the beaches of Normandy, Guam, Okinawa, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Panama, the Persian Gulf, the mountains of Afghanistan, and the streets of Baghdad, and scores of places long forgotten by all but those who were with me, I was there. I've led my service men, I followed them, I watched over them, they loved me. I was on a small hill in Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle worn, and tired, but service men cheered me, and I was proud. I've been sore, torn, burned, and trampled on the streets of Turkey. God helped me to set free. It does not hurt, because I am invincible. I've been sore, torn, burned, and trampled on the streets of my own country. And what it is are those with whom I have served in battle. It hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the bounds of the earth, that's why my bank is grown and moved. I stand and watch on uncharted new frontier of space. I have been a solemn witness to all of America's finest hour. But my finest hour comes when I'm torn into strips to be used as vanity for my wounded comrades on the field of battle. And when I fly half staff during my service in, or when I'm lying in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the graveside of a fallen son or daughter, I am proud. My name is the old glory. Long may I wave. To God, long may I wave. Thank you. And no, I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, today's honoree. Colonel Carl Mason.
put that in there because what we talked about, because I believe one of the failures today is that they don't allow the NCOs to lead. Because the NCOs will say that they are the keeper of the soldiers, but they got to give the soldier the officer also. So thank you for upholding that, uh, and I thank you for all that you've done. Uh, just a few quick more thank yous before I get in. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to start, I'm going to hit a few people on the front row. The Honorable Larry Turner, uh, as General Vereen says, uh, you know, I, I, I do kind of self-promote myself. Uh, when, <laughs> 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 you know, you got to make it funny. So when I first met the Honorable Larry Turner, he, obviously he's part of the greatest fraternity in the world, but, but uh, he told me that, uh, he said, you got to always look the part. And so, you know, I would come and I would try to address uh, Mr. Turner. And then, so Mr. Turner leaned over one day. He said, your closet's not that deep. You know, you got to start with a few jokes. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the Honorable Miss Miller, too. So, so I used to be, I was Miss Miller's first male XO ever. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, so when I left her, I went to battalion command. And so my CG was the deputy G3, so he went out and came to CG. And so, you know, we was at command, and it snowed, because I was at Carson at 704. And so Ms. Miller got kind of caught in the snow, and you know, it's, it's a great story. So we were running kind of late. My brigade commander said, when are we going to start? And the CG said, uh, he said, I don't care how late we are. We ain't going to start until Ms. Miller gets here. And uh, he said, I said, and he said, why is that, sir? He said, because something you don't know about Ms. Miller, boy, she can chew a butt. <laughs> and everybody started laughing. <laughs> And so, and so uh, he said, so we're going to wait. And of course, you know, Ms. we had Miss Miller's seat beside my boss, and I love it. So she came in late, and she had this huge white meat coat on. And I mean, like she glared across uh, the thing. But I, I thank her for, for everything, giving me the opportunity, and making me read every book before I went to the War College when I was serving as an XO. General Bingham, I'm humbled that you would fly from Texas uh, to, to come here. I, I have to take the time to thank you guys because uh, you, you guys took time out of your schedule and, you, and, and protocol was terrified when they saw my list so I, I have to at least stay, <laughs> at least they, they were trying to figure out who I was probably. I have to thank you for doing that. You and PJ have always been there. Uh, even uh, when I was in battalion command after Miss Miller incident, I met General Bingham. She said she needed an aide and she kept me out like I didn't have PT in the morning but, uh, uh, but I want to thank you now. General Mark. You know, I'm going to get hurt. So, I, so back then, when you were battalion commander, your, your, your whole life was to make it through NTC. Uh, if, uh, and so I, was, I had got all these attachments. I got this MP company. And so, and I highlight her because, you know, we talk about this. It, it, as, as I said, General Marine's a better man and a great soldier. But you want to test these guys. So I went to her office. I said, ma'am, I got this MP company. She said, clear my calendar. And so she got up. Hey, she's a one star. She got up, and I tell you, as we talk about dedication and people caring for you, she drew out what I should do with all my attachments on the board. And I said, hey, you know what? And I actually killed it at NTC. But I will never forget that story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm giving her the credit now. You know? <laughs> hey, now you know the truth. I, I, I'm going to mess with General Smith because I won't get this opportunity again. Uh, so General Smith, uh, obviously another guy part of the greatest return the world. We call General Smith uh, the Grand Hater because everywhere you go, he's always messing with you. And, and you know, he was the IG. He's better than General Mark because he would always say, man, I heard something about you. So he's the IG, so you're terrified. Man, what did you hear? What did you hear? He would never tell you what he heard. But, uh, and so, you know, I'm thinking I'm about to get investigated and get fired. And, you know. So that, so you know, it only has to be partial truth, right? Uh, hey, General Proctor, thank you for your undying service. Uh, one, one day, uh, you're going to be part of this, the other part of my speech. But hey, I thank you for this. You and and Miss Hurd, I'm going to beat up on you because when, when she was at my 06 promotion at DLA, and uh, and she gave me an additional duty. So she said. Colonel Mason gave a great, great speech, but I don't know if that was a speech or, or, or a trial sermon. <laughs> so after that, my pastor put me on the docket. So I guess, I, so I've been, so I, I thank you for you and your husband always doing this. Uh, just all of you, you know, Admiral English, Mr. Ray Hauser, Dr. Hedge, I thank you guys. 
Hey, you know, Sarvin, Mr. Burner, thank you guys. And thank all of you. I want to do that up front. Uh, I, have from, from, I have from my first boss, I saw uh, Mr. McPeak come here with his smooth hat on. I saw my old battalion commander, Darren Williams, who, who told me the pressure is the same. Uh, he, uh, and I even got my college roommate in here, Andre Spicer, who drove up. Uh, what, and I, and I, I just want to attack people. My supply sergeant drove up, uh, Sergeant Hankins, my old company commander buddy, uh, Reagan Allen, just a, just a few people I thank you, uh, all of you for coming. So today, because I know I'm going to miss somebody, but I want to hit a few because I'm starting to get emotional, so let me get into what I do. So today, as Jennifer Reen said, it's like I read his notes too. Uh, what do you say at a ceremony? I believe retirement is an unbiblical thing. I don't believe that, that no one retires because, you know, as these people sit in the front, you know, he's still General Smith and he'll let you know. And he's still General Proctor. It's on his car if you don't know. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, so General Proctor, they'll let, they'll let you know, you know, they come in, where am I see that and all that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, so that's why I say retirement is, 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 is no such thing. You transition. You transition, you know. I'm going to get my license plate. I, I won't be the 47th quartermaster general, but I will. Uh, I'll best I'll be the colonel. So, so I say that. So what do you say at these ceremonies? You know, uh, my pastor talked about it. Uh, I, was, I was studying. I was trying to write something down. I called, I texted General Green, see what he's doing on this speech. He said, I'm good. I was like, that ain't no help. Thanks, sir. You know? <laughs> so, I, so I said, uh, I started reading the good book. That's always my guide. And so I, it took me to the second chapter of Timothy. And so as you look at that, and, I, and it's, it's great today because the boss mentioned that. Why did he mention that? Because what did Paul do? Paul knew he was going to die. Nero was going to kill him. But he thought enough of the people to write his last letter, his last time on this earth, not to the family, but to the people he served. So today, I would like to, to, to follow that, and I want to continue on with the first, as Jennifer Reen said, the first exercise I had as a second lieutenant. And the name of my speech is called the Tube Kit, as uh, Colonel Zagorniski laid out. Since Ms. Miller made me read all them books, she said you should always leave people with something. So, Got four items here, and I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm going to be quick so y'all can eat the food, and I know it's warm in here. So my first assignment in the Army I thought was amazing. My battalion commander, yes, uh, I, I, had, I had briefed the, the Secretary of Defense in OBC, so I guess I've been thrown in the fire right at the beginning. And so I thought I was going to Fort Bragg, they changed it, and sent me to Korea. That's how I got to Camp Casey, 272 Army. And then so... Uh, the battalion commander gave this assignment out, and I was the only lieutenant that did it. And so he, it was, I'm not going to talk about what he did, because that's probably not legal now. But, uh, <laughs> so the, the assignment was, what is your legacy? And what type of leader are you going to be? And so, and so I, I came in his office, you know, and I, I was like, wow. You know, sir, uh, and I had this lunchbox, a Bible, uh, a mirror, and a deck of cards. And so he was like, okay, this is interesting. He said, but you already got a leg up because you're the only lieutenant that did this time. And so that's how I rise, they were, were going to make me a tank platoon leader. And so he said, well, talk me through this. And I said, okay, sir, this will be my legacy. And he said, because this assignment should never end, it should continue to go. He said, because if you're not thinking about that, then you're not the leader that I believe that you can be and what people have already said about you as a second lieutenant. He said, so, and so I, and I think today, this is beautiful because I think today we are struggling with leaders. I think, I think the Army today, and, and me and Sergeant Major Perry talk about this, we, they're struggling with leaders and leaders, but I want to give you a few things from my toolkit. I don't have as many as General Brigham because, you know, she's a general, so, you know. But I just want to give you a few of them. So let's start. So I got four Fs, and I'm going to hit these, and I'm going to get out the way and, uh, 
and do this. The first F is my faith. Jennifer Reed hit that. I, I got the good book here. Why, why, do I, why did I start with, with my faith? Because I believe that people, they get out the gate wrong. They start, they start wrong, and so if you get out the gate wrong, what are you doing? The things behind you trip you up. So as Jennifer Reed said, press forward at the mark of the high calling. You can't run because you're tripping on things behind you. So if you don't have any faith, because he, as I tell my daughter, who's a second lieutenant, believe me, they need you. And you'll learn that when you show up, remember, whenever you show up at a unit, whether it's coming here, whether it's whatever, Ms. Miller showing up, we learned it. They had no vote on you. Our major is there praying that you're going to be worth your salt, and <laughs> you show up, but they had no vote on you. So you showed up, even at this level, they got appointed and they showed up, they have no vote on you. But when they show up, they're expecting you to be everything that they've been reading about. As I look at Mr. Williams back there, if you're not, then what do we call you in the 501st? We called you a paper line. You look good on paper, but you're not that guy. And we still waiting to find that's a, that, But I'm serious. We say that, but that's what you are. You, you own this paper and you look great. Where, you be thinking, where is that guy? So I'm ready to be in his office. Where is that guy? He in there drinking? Where is that guy? Where is that guy? So my faith, because I, and I stand on that Bible, and I told him I leaned that, because, you know, if you look at Matthew 7, which I think is one of the scariest scriptures in the Bible, says, depart from me. Uh, you work with me. I never knew you. But what gets me about that is the same thing I want to tie to this. It's an open book test. So when people show up and they're not prepared, why didn't you read the book? I would never go in one of these general offices or anybody's office unprepared, because there's a book for everything. But we struggle in that on the first F because we don't have any faith and we don't open the book. The second F is what is your foundation? I got a lunchbox there. I'm at General Marine and Audible Mr. Turner. We're all from North Carolina. And we're all, funny thing, within 30 minutes of each other. No one would have ever guessed that we would be here probably today. So I had a lunchbox, because that's what my dad gave me. He was telling me to go out of the house and <laughs> head out. But the great thing about this lunchbox is, he said, son, you need to bring your work ethic, and you need to bring your heart every day. Because he said, that's the foundation. Because cause you know what? And he did, he did this, and I'll never forget it. He opened it. It was nothing inside. He said, but the great thing about that, no one knows that. But there, as long as it stays closed, you can grow and put things inside. And that's how you build your foundation. But he said, but if you don't bring this to work every day, you've already started off wrong. So I don't know if people show up ready to work every day. I don't know if they bring that lunch. So they have no foundation. And so you know what? When, when you struggle, everybody else struggles, no matter what. So people say, we're busy, but you're just doing a lot, but you're not getting nothing done because they have no direction. So you got to bring your lunch today. You got you to have your faith intact, and you got to have your foundation. Bring your lunch every day. And you know what? And what you put on the inside is what I, as I told the stories up front, that's why I did. Those are things that I put on the inside that I take with me everywhere. Because you know what? You know, the general prop that called you all times of the night. So you got to always have your lunch by or with you, <laughs> ready to care. And, and you know what? And, and I use him, because he, he does. But I say that because you should always be prepared. Because you always carry your lunch pail with you. My dad says, Genesis 1 says, God, he created the heavens and the earth. We know that as it goes around. Then as you, you, you proceed through, it says he created us to work. That's why I said there's no such thing as retirement. Now, you may transition to something else, but you still got to continue to work. General Bingham's here. She's transitioning. A lot, General Prop's transitioning. We all have to do it, but we don't stop. It's a great book that I challenge you to read called Halftime by Bob Buford. And it talks about that transition. It says we go from success to significance. So your, my first half, I think I did well, General Green. I thank you, sir, for highlighting it. I thank all of you for feeling it. That was success. Now it's time for me to take all that I've learned and now that I'm at halftime, because I'm only at halftime. And now it's time to move to significance and carry my lunch pail with me to the next chapter. 
There's still work to be done. A person who won't stand for nothing will fall for anything. And people are falling because there's no one there to teach them how to stand. You can bring your lunch pail, the mirror. Not because I'm a brother of Cap Alpha Psi, do I have it there? <laughs> 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 I knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, but you know why, why I say that? It, the, the mirror represents your fortitude. Your fortitude is, is, is your mindset that you change to accept things that are tough. That's really what it means. And why do I got a mirror? Because you need to look inside and look at yourself. Because if you don't master that person, you will never move forward. Because I realized in my, in my years, that's the greatest enemy. That's the person that really beats you down. Because they're looking back. And if you can't tell that person, I'm all that what the good Lord has made. I'm all that. And I show up every day with my Bible, with my lunch pail, and I can look at that guy and say, hey, I am better than that. I am ready to leave. If you can't do that, then you've already lost. And now have you lost, your soldiers lost. And who else loses? Your family. Because if you stink at leadership at work, you suck at home. I'm telling you, it's a balance. Jennifer Green will tell her, he said, get out of here. He'll, he'll start kicking us out. We used to call Miss Miller's husband, it was a nap game. We're getting her out there early. <laughs> 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 Mr. Loman had to work today, but he knows. That's what I learned from Mr. Loman. He was always smiling, but we used to call him Batman because he would sneak out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to balance that. They taught me that. She'd be in full Nats gear, rolling out. But you got to balance that. You, that's part of it. See, we only, it, it kills me, we look at our evaluations at work, and we'll say, hey, I got a top block, I got a five, I got this. What does your home eval look like? What is my wife writing on me? What are my kids writing on me? Yeah, that's right, you see it? See, that's the man, I'm getting that center I'm trying to get up. <laughs> that's why I added Saul Major Magruder, I'm trying to get up. <laughs> you see? And that's very true. And my pastor hit it because we talk about that. You know, I've been to so many retirement ceremonies, you know, where they got a, a, a daughter like mine, a second lieutenant, and then they got a kindergarten because things happen, things cycle. So you have to be able to look at that person in the mirror and be that guy and lead. You have to do that. You have to study. You have to be prepared. There is no one else. When they come in that office, my daughter's learning that now. She's been in the Air Force six months, and she's a flight commander. She hasn't even been to school yet. And she said, Dad, I'm stressed. I'll be like, yeah, just get on in there. You're good. <laughs> get, on get on in there. That's right. That's what they told me last minute. Get on in there. You know? She's in there. But because I told her, nobody cares what rank you are if you're doing the job. Nobody cares. Nobody cares she hasn't been to school. I told you, your commander don't care. I said, look in the mirror every day, master that person, and you go out there and get after it. You got to go out there. People love to use the, the scripture, Jeremiah 27, iron sharpens iron. But it's amazing to me that nobody wants to get into the fight. Nobody wants to get into the fight. The first person keeping you out the fire is that person that's looking back in the mirror. Master that person. So we talked about our faith. We talked about our foundation. We talked about the fortitude. And you know, and I will end with this because you know, I got to recognize the good brothers of Kappa Alpha Psi. 35 years ago, six days, four hours, <laughs> 10 seconds. <laughs> and, and I say that because Jennifer Marie highlighted, I came to college, uh, what a lot of people don't know as we talk about fortitude. Uh, my mother was killed two days after Christmas, my senior year in high school. I was broken, I was going down the wrong path. And I tell you, I, I honor my fraternity and I work in there, because one, I believe God gave it to me as a ministry, and two, because I really believe Kappa Alpha Psi probably saved my life. So I was able to, to I made the line, you know, back then, and <laughs> <laughs> they shaved my hair and my eyebrows. And <laughs> He said, move all into this room together, put six mattresses there. And I tell you, and I say that because people talk about it, but I tell you, what it did, it kept me disciplined for a long time until I 
but it would probably save my life. And it, and it taught me things to give me back to my faith, to my foundation, and it gave me fortitude. They taught me things like excuses or tools of incompetence that be a mighty mess of nothing. And those that specialize in themselves will do anything else. Excuses, excuses, excuses. That's why when I got in the Army, I, I never gave Miss Miller any excuses. <laughs> That's right. They told me things like be strong, do not play dream or drill, for there's hard work to be done and loads to live. Shun not to struggle for it's God's gift. Be strong. They told me them things. So when the Sergeant Major said, hey, sir, it's on you, man. You got you to pick it up. We ain't all right, man. You got to pick it up. You got to be strong. You got to have that fortitude. And the last one is family. Why do I got a deck of cards? This is, this is what I want to leave you with. All you get these tools if you choose. So, I, so the, my boss was sitting there. I dealt seven cards out. And he was about to grab them. I said, sir, don't touch them. He said, why not? I said, sir, because it doesn't matter what them cards are. You got to play them. See, God dealt my family to me, he, whatever unit I show up. So it doesn't matter, sir, what them cards are. You got a plan. So I want you to accept that first, that those are your cards. See, that's a problem today. People want to pick their cards. They want to pick their team. You know, Jennifer Reen didn't come in and say, hey, man, I want this guy. I want this. They didn't do that. They want to pick their team. And what would they do? They'll pick all the high cards in the deck. See, that's not leadership. That's lifership. And see, then I said, okay, sir, pick those cards up. So he picked the seven cards up. And I said, he said, well, what? I said, sir, don't tell me what you got. I said, because the lesson I will leave you with is my, your goal is to organize them cards and win the hand. It doesn't matter the way you organize them because I may do it differently. But you have to accept that and organize those cards so that you can win your hand. When you figure that out, then you can look behind you because people are following you and you're not just on a stroll. See, that's the problem. People think they're leading, but they're just on a stroll. You got to get the cards. You got to organize them to be who you are and fight. So why do I do that as a family? Because you. I turn wherever I go into a family. Jennifer Reed's right. I walk in his office, we talk. I walk in Star Major's office, we talk. Because it has to be a family. Why do I say that? Because we spend more time with people at work than we do with our own family. I don't live in hell at home. I would not live in hell at work. But we do every day. Organize the cards. Have your faith together. That's your baseline. That's the center of gravity. Make sure that your foundation is straight. Have the fortitude and the courage and the commitment to move forward. Accept who you are and lead. And then in the end, create a family, create a team. Be that person that we've been waiting on that we knew you are, that you knew you were the whole time. But if you don't believe it, like my golf game. At least look good. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm, I'm going to transition to a few things about my family. But those are my tools. That's what, that's what I did. That's what I told them. And, and as I transitioned to have my family, a few tokens, I told them I, I chose those things, and I'll leave it like that, because you know what? I did it as a second lieutenant. Here I am now, transitioning out. And I said, sir, this assignment never changes. It continues on. It's a legacy. So it's about the legacy that you leave. It's not about what you do. It's about the people that you help and the legacy that you leave. So with that, I'm going to give a few things and tokens out. Let's start with the, uh, with the gift bags. OK, let me, yeah, let me get these blue ones right here. The all the, yeah, that. So I'm, I'm going to give these out of the way so we can move on. And because I don't fed you spiritually now, I know y'all ready to eat. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm going to hit my my two two pieces off because they came up here and they said Uncle Carl is is the man. So I'm going to continue being the man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give you that. Let me grab one more gift for my sister-in-law. Uh, 
I tried to label these so they would go faster, Ted. I apologize. Uh, uh, Miami. That's what it's not it. Uh, okay. So this is for my my sister-in-law, Maya. Let me get these out because I'm about to pass out. This is for my mother-in-law. Stand up, Miss Pledge. I'm going to call you out. <laughs> Get my uncle and aunt, Dr. Kevin Pleasants. We'll hit them off right quick. <laughs> yeah, and Tracy, thank you. So my, my, my uncle, Dr. Kevin Pleasants, and his wife, Tracy, if you have him in Raleigh, he's the pastor of Chosen Generation Church. He's retired, saw him first class. And you know what? A great story. He used to work for Jim Vereen. And when he was in recruiting command. But I tell you, as we talk about transition, a life of service. He's starting a powerful ministry in Raleigh, North Carolina, to invest in our youth. And, it, and, 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 and that's where I kind of got my saying, each one must teach one to reach one. So, so I thank you. All right, give me that big red bag, yep. All right, and uh, that small gold one right there. Yeah, just right here, yep. All right, let me get my family out of the way so I can get out. So this is for my nephew, Q, and my niece, uh, Shawan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, Sinead. So uh, I, have, I have two older brothers. One is in North Carolina, He's, he couldn't be here today, and I have one that passed. He passed six months after my mother did. And uh, he had a daughter, a beautiful daughter. He passed, and she was 15 months old. She's gone on to, to, to graduate with her bachelor's, and her master's degree, and being an amazing counselor and teacher. Uh, and, and I'm so proud of her. Uh, and I was honored when I got to escort her at her wedding. And so, uh, and then she has a husband, Q, uh, a good man about attorney, so she speaks well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I would like to share this, Jennifer Reed knows this, and, so uh, sadly, her, her mother passed about four months ago. She won her battle with cancer, I would say. And, uh, and I tell you, and she told me uh, to do one thing. She says, she says, continue to watch over and love her. And that's what I'm going to do, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. All right, to my uncle, my mother's brother, my uncle Nick McCarran, the original pretty boy. Yeah. <laughs> so he was the one that was outside smoothing y'all down when he came in. I, I, will, I will apologize to all the ladies up front. <laughs> uh, he called you things like darling, Colonel Darling walked in and things like that. But I tell you, I have always been there since I was a young one. Uh, when my mother got mad at me, she would call me his name. I knew I was really in trouble. Uh, <laughs> but I tell you, I love him, and he's always there. And, uh, and, he just, and he, he's had some health problems, but he pressed forward and drove from Atlanta to be here, so I thank you. Uh, Mr. Leon Pleasant, my father-in-law, I got to hit him up. So Jennifer Reed said a great quote from the great General Colin Powell. So my father-in-law saw a first class for Ty Leon Pleasant. General Marine didn't know this, but I was hoping he was going to use that quote. My father-in-law served in General Powell's battalion when he was a battalion commander. He, and so now the, that's great. And everybody's like, wow. The sad thing is that he always compared me to General Powell. <laughs> 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 kind of tough, you know. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate him. I always say he, he told me when I, when I first talked to him. He told me that I was the right man for his daughter. And, uh, and I tell you, I love him and I appreciate that. So. <laughs> All right. So I'm going. Okay, so I'm going to hit my pastor off and his wife. And they're looking surprised because they didn't know this. So, so obviously, as I said, Ms. Hurt 
had told me that I, had, I need to be on the teaching docket, and so my pastor heard you, and he had me speaking to uh, my pastor is the uh, deputy IT director for Fairfax County Schools. And so uh, he allowed me to speak to his guys on the leadership day. I took a book out of General Marines, and uh, I talked to about 200 people. You know, it's different when you talk to civilians, uh, completely not with the military, because they can boo you off the stage, you man. You know, so I, so I was pretty nervous, you know. I was like, wow, you know. I, you know, you know, you know, you know, you see people like Amber English, she's like, man, you know, you go, you go, they can boo you off the stage. I'm like, sir, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> and so, but I tell you, I appreciate him. I sit under him now uh, as he's uh, moves to be our senior pastor. Uh, I love him, and I, and I tell you, I'm honored that you could do the prayer today. So, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, don't worry about it. So the, la the last gift before I get to uh, the final flowers uh, and my son is for Ted. So I want to thank, first of all, all of the G9 for everything you did, all the proffers and, and all, everyone for what you did. But I, but I tell you, uh, I, w I was going to kind of do the Fort Myers ceremony and slide out. Uh, Ted kind of lectured me and then Jennifer Marine lectured me when I went in his office. And they and, and Jim Marine said, and I'm glad he didn't put in his speech. He said, you know everybody, man. Ain't nowhere in the world that you're gonna get out of here. But I want to thank Ted Z. I think he did a great job. I'll ask that you 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 give these guys a round of applause. <laughs> everybody, I, I, I thank you. But Ted, I got a little token for you, man. Uh, so you can keep our tradition on on on, on Fridays going, okay? All right. <laughs> All right, yeah, take these. I mean, grab that red bag. I'll get him first. I can get this. Big. So this big bag is for my namesake, Carl Eric Mason Jr. Uh, you know, I got my oldest daughter who I w who's watching online, uh, and my granddaughter and my, and my son-in-law couldn't be here today. She, uh, she's an executive at Cisco. And so how God has blessed me is uh, as I'm retiring, because she was my one that said I would never go in the military then. And so the great thing is, since I've been transitioning out, now we're having these great conversations. So I want to tell her, because uh, she's closing a huge deal with Cisco today. And uh, maybe I'll get some of the commission for this. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell her I love her, and uh, my granddaughter, Johanna, and my son-in-law, he ain't half bad either. I'll tell you, Keegan. So, uh, <laughs> My son, Carl Mason Jr., uh, probably the best man I know. Uh, he could be doing a lot of other stuff uh, at 17 and a senior. 4.1 GPA, all dual enrollment classes, got the pick of the litter of, 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 of a lot of things, but he chooses to do the right thing. And he, and he, and he told me, he said, Dad, one day we were in the car, and I, and I tell you guys that I talked about my toolkit. He told me something that I would never forget, and I will always love him for. We were riding, we, we, we go get our haircuts, you know, father and son thing. And he looked over at me, and he said, hey, Dad, you're doing a great job as my father. Aww. You know, you know I've, I've done a lot and had a lot of people to say great things about me. But uh, for your son to look over there and say that, it's amazing, uh, and I tell you, uh, I love him, and he's going to do something great. Uh, I'm going to hit my sister because she's already crying trying to look away from me. Uh, so straight from Galveston, Texas, as you see, they do big things, and she got a big outfit on, her big boots. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Marie, we were messing with <laughs> Saw Major was like, wow, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, you know, uh, first of all, I would like to honor her husband, Mr. Leonard Hightower. He's a Marine veteran. The doctor wouldn't let him travel because of uh, his heart, so I want to tell him we love him. She drove him, flew in from Galveston, Texas. And so no matter where we are, she's always going to be there. Uh, for us, and uh, you know, uh, it's, it's my big sister. She still treats me like that, uh, you know. Uh, and I tell you, I love her, and uh, and I tell you, she is always 
on her knees praying for me. And I, and I thank you and I love you. <laughs> All right, my other mother-in-law. So, you know, the 82nd does things for you. Don't judge my, don't judge my father-in-law, man, okay. <laughs> don't judge my father-in-law, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer Marie had me in the office, man. Let me figure this out. So, sir, it's going to be okay. Yeah. He's my man. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, mother, Miss Jeannie, uh, I tell you, uh, always been an entrepreneur, has a great story of how she came over here, started her own business, and started doing things. But I tell you, the greatest thing that I love about her is the love that she has for, for the grandkids. And, uh, and no matter what I tell her they don't need, she's going to buy. If, if I tell her they don't need, she's going to get two. So, uh, and and uh, whether we are, wherever we are, she's always going to be there. And I tell you, I love you and I thank you. <laughs> All right, to my, my daughter, Samaya. So, uh, so my daughter, Samaya, is uh, a champion for autism. So she has been a champion there ever since she's, uh, she's done this. I'm going to get through, Ms. Miller. I'm going to get through this. And so everything they said she couldn't do, she did. And so, uh, so this year, uh, she transitioned from high school. And uh, there's a program at George Mason, if you don't know. It's one of the top programs for children uh, with autism to go to college. Out of 10,000 applicants, they go from 10,000 or more all over the country, all over the world, to 37 to 25. And they choose five. My daughter, Samaya, was one of the five that got in. Second Lieutenant Mason, boy. <laughs> Big time basketball player, so she probably was better than she was. See where that gets. And so the funny story is I bring that up because, so you know, I had her in the not paying for college track. And then she said, hey, Dad, I don't want to play basketball. And I'm like, what? You know, I, you messing with the church money. I ain't have I ain't thinking we were paying for college. You know, I would take you to AAU. I could have a Range Rover. I could be riding like Jennifer Reen now. But, but, but so she said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy. I'm like, man, it must be nice just say I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy. And so she got in. And so she went to her interview. And I tell you, this defines who my daughter is. So the interview is the panel of people and all these people. There's one Colonel Air Force 06 up there. He was kind of beaten up pretty good. And so he asked her a question. And they were in a room. You know, they had the chair there. And uh, she, I made her wear an ROTC uniform for high school. And he asked her, he said, and the lady, the president, was like, good God, how many questions are you going to ask her? And, uh, and he asked her, what makes her different than everybody else out there? It was hundreds of kids out there interviewing for all the different cabinets. And so my daughter got up. She got up. She opened the door. He said, hey, ma'am, Miss Mason, we got time. She said, there's a lot of people out there. She said, uh, she said, yes, sir, it is a lot of people out there. She said, but you asked me what makes me different. She said, everybody out there, all they want is a free ride to education. I'm the only one that wants to serve their country. That's what makes my daughter better. And that's what makes her different. And I know in my, in my promotion, they said one day that General Mason would walk in the Pentagon. They're still right, because there she is right there. <laughs> Uh-oh, last but not least, will I cry? No, I'm not. Because <laughs> I know I, I need y'all to eat all this food because I can't take it home. So to my wife, Jennifer Reen told it, you know, uh, I didn't put it down. I'm a pretty good singer, too. I can sing a little Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> Reasons! <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm glad Jennifer Reen told a good story because, you know, uh, the, the, the real thing is I kind of fabricated, Ms. Miller knows, that's why she's laughing. I fabricated my age. So I'm a little older than she is. And, uh, and so, uh, 
<laughs> and so, and so the, you know, the lie was, I mean, the story was going well. <laughs> and then, uh, and, uh, you know, she had a little sorority jacket on and went a little pink and green and, and you know, and so, so I had my jacket on. And, and that was the first time I kind of, you know, you don't never really wear your frat stuff. So I had my jacket on. She looked and she said, does that say 89? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so, but I, but I tell you, uh, my wife's amazing. She, uh, she was the one that got the four-year Army, Army ROTC scholarship. When I retired General Lally in this room, he said, if the husband and wife end, the wife is always better. I was like, thanks, sir. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but uh, got selected for the Health Professional Scholarship. And she walked in and told me that one of us have to get out. And she said, I'm going to do it. And she told me to do one thing. She said, be the best every day. So that's all I've tried to do. And then, as General Breen eloquently told the story, but she said something to me that I will never forget that I'm going to end my speech today with. I, as he said, I said, look, I'm going to marry you one day. And she said, I bet you tell all the girls that. <laughs> She said, then she came right back. General Marine's right. She came back and said, you got all these women. I was like, what? What are you talking about? I don't got no girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, uh, she said, but let me tell you something. And this is what I leave you guys with, with the toolkit. She said, let me tell you what makes me different. She said, all these women out here and all these people that follow you, they can only see what you are now. She said, what makes me different is, she said, I can see what you're going to become. And so that's what I tell you. It's not how you start out, it's how you finish. From my parents, who really, this is their dream. My mother told me that one person can make a difference. My dad said, you know, stop asking God uh, for a lighter load, asking for a stronger back. He said, that's what men do. They carry the load. So I thank you for always being there. Uh, I thank you for for seeing what no one else saw in me. And, uh, and I love you. And, uh, and I tell you, uh, we're going to end with that. Because as I said, the legacy is it ends with your family. Because in the end, we're all family. And the Army is one team. Army strong. I love all y'all. Thank y'all for coming. <laughs>